Thank you to 23andMe for supporting PBS Digital Studios. To unlock the mysteries of the universe, some sacrifices will have to be made. So far, the greatest, most noble deaths in the name of science have been those of robotic explorers. Let's take a moment to remember them. Human space travel is tough. It takes a lot of tech to keep people alive up there and a lot more to bring them safely home. But we have few qualms about sending robots on one-way suicide missions to the stars. And it's not just that we have no intention of bringing them home, we've sent robotic probes into environments we knew full well would destroy them. And in some cases, the very destruction of these probes is part of the scientific experiment or in the case of the recent destruction of Cassini, to protect the solar system for future experiments. Today, we're going to memorialize the robots that have given their lives in the name of exploration. Venus, with its dense, searing hot atmosphere, is the most ravenous consumer of Earth-made landers, and the Soviet Union fed it the most. From 1966 to 1982, 12 probes from the Soviet Venera program were devoured by Venus's atmosphere. After a few probes were destroyed on descent, Venera 7 became the first ever man-made probe to land on another world in 1970. It fought against the blistering 445 Celsius heat and crushing 90 atmosphere pressure for 23 minutes before going quiet. This was just long enough to make the first ever transmission from the surface of another planet, accurate temperature and pressure readings of the atmosphere that killed it. These measurements would have been impossible outside Venus's thick atmosphere. Seven more generations of Venera probe landed on Venus, ultimately sending back our first images from the surface of another world. Venus devoured all of them, with Venera 13 surviving the longest at 127 minutes. Mars is also a favorite destination for doomed robots. In some ways, it's harder to land things on Mars due to its extremely thin atmosphere, which makes parachuted-assisted soft landings very difficult. There's a rich history of robot death on Mars, from the ill-fated series of Soviet Mars landers, more like crash landers, to the notorious Mars Climate Orbiter, which accidentally entered the Martian atmosphere due to a unit conversion error. But let's focus on the positive. The probes that, despite having no prospect of ever returning home, delivered far more science than anyone thought possible. I'm talking about NASA's Martian rovers, Spirit and Opportunity. These identical probes touched down in early 2004 on what was planned to be a 90-day mission exploring the geology of the Martian surface. Their primary goal, to search for signs of past water activity. But their doom was sealed before they launched. Their designers knew that the solar panels would soon be covered by Martian dust, drastically limiting their lifespan. But this time, the alien atmosphere proved the savior rather than the destroyer of robots. Right after landing, the power output of the rover's panels dropped as expected, but then inexplicably, sporadic recoveries in power were observed. NASA scientists soon realized that the dust was being cleaned from the solar panels by the Martian wind. With help from these cleaning events, the rovers roved on, ultimately returning a wealth of evidence of Mars's watery past. Spirit finally succumbed to the dust beneath it, becoming stuck in a sand trap. It continued to transmit as a stationary science platform for over a year before we finally lost contact in 2010. But at that point, the little rover had lasted 25 times its original mission plan. And opportunity? Well, some say that it still roves to this very day. Actually, NASA says that. Crazily, opportunity is still fully operational and still doing science. It's now traveled 45 kilometers across the Martian surface, more than any other interplanetary surface vehicle. Keep roving, little buddy. One day we'll come for you. Spirit and Opportunity may have fought hard and long, but it was Cassini that made the ultimate sacrifice. This orbiter studied Saturn and its moons and rings for 13 years. Cassini's most incredible discovery is arguably that of hydrothermal vents on Enceladus. This moon is a world covered in ice, 
But beneath that ice is a world-spanning ocean 30 kilometers deep, apparent from the geysers that occasionally erupt from the ice. Cassini found the presence of sand, ammonia, and organic molecules in the spray of these geysers, which tells us that they are powered by hydrothermal vents on a solid ocean floor. Such vents on Earth's ocean floor host rich living ecosystems and may even have been the origin of life on Earth. This discovery of a potentially habitable environment on Enceladus only further sealed Cassini's fates. One day, we'll land probes on the moon and even drill into its ocean. If those missions find signs of microbial life, we want to be 100% sure that it was not brought there by us. On the remote chance that Cassini is carrying microbial contaminants from Earth, and it crashes into Enceladus after decommissioning, a sacrifice had to be made by decree of NASA's awesomely named Office of Planetary Protection. On September 15th, 2017, Cassini was plunged into Saturn's atmosphere, where it ended spectacularly in cleansing fire. The Planetary Protection Agency has issued death sentences in the past. The Galileo probe was deorbited into Jupiter to protect its moons, in particular Europa, which boasts a vast ocean under its own icy crust. Juno, a probe sent to Jupiter in 2011, will meet the same fate in 2021. Where some spacecraft are destroyed to protect future science, in other cases their destruction is the scientific experiment. Some of the most mysterious entities in our solar system are the comets that dwell in the Kuiper Belt, far outside our planetary system. These small icy bodies are thought to carry many secrets of our solar system's formation. To unlock the secrets of the comet, we've resorted to a time-honored approach to scientific inquiry. Smash the object and see what happens. This was the Deep Impact mission, a probe launched by NASA in 2005 to impact Comet Temple 1. A large fraction of the spacecraft's mass was a 370 kilogram impactor, really a robotic probe all on its own. The impactor guided itself headlong into Temple 1 at 10 kilometers per second, delivering nearly five tons of TNT in kinetic impact energy and forming a crater 30 meters deep. Tens of millions of kilograms of comet were ejected in a debris cloud to be analyzed by the surviving spacecraft component of Deep Impact. Deep Impact sacrifice significantly furthered our understanding of comets and paved the way for future ill-fated landers like Philae. This lander for the Rosetta Comet mission failed to deploy its harpoons during its 2014 landing attempt. This caused it to bounce into a region too shaded for its solar-powered operation. Even so, the stubborn little robot did manage to send back the first images from the surface of a comet and to detect some organic compounds that had never before been seen in comet material. It's now silent, riding its eternal cometary home into the distant Kuiper Belt. The robotic explorers I've mentioned all found their final resting places. But the same can't be said of the probes we sent to the outer reaches of our solar system. Pioneer 10 and 11, Voyager 1 and 2, and New Horizons are all on trajectories that will fling them into interstellar space. In fact, Voyager 1 is already there. After 35 years exploring our solar system, in 2012 it passed the heliopause, the boundary where the sun's magnetic field and solar wind give way to the ambient environment of the Milky Way. And unlike the long silent Pioneer spacecraft, Voyager 1 still sends faint radio signals, bringing us our first and only direct measurements from beyond our home system. But this signal is fading. Its decaying plutonium power source will only support operations to 2025. After that, Voyager 1 will meet its very lonely doom, perhaps floating forever in the coldness between the stars. As much as we like to anthropomorphize, these robots are just robots. But perhaps it's right to feel pride in their exploits and sadness at their demise. It's our way of honoring the many brilliant scientists and engineers who poured their own lives into these ingenious machines. And eventually, real live human explorers will follow these brave machines, hopefully with far fewer fatalities. And then we'll find inspiration from the sacrifices of the robots 
who gave their little silicon lives to blaze the very first paths into outer space-time. Thanks to 23andMe for supporting PBS Digital Studios. 23andMe comes from the fact that the human DNA is organized into 23 pairs of chromosomes. 23andMe is a personal genetic analysis company created to help people understand their DNA. Speaking of ancestors, 23andMe can help connect you with family and remind you of what you have in common, which can be particularly important this time of year. You may not share a lot of the same opinions, but you definitely share a lot of the same DNA. Show your support for the show by checking out 23andMe.com slash spacetime. The past couple of episodes have continued our discussion of the quantum vacuum and zero-point energy, including some discussion of the pseudoscience behind these ideas. Not surprisingly, this generated some heated discussion. Let's get into some of it. The Gekonata 5000, and impressively, several other people pointed out that the first gecko we showed is a leopard gecko, which is one of the few geckos that don't actually have these casimir-powered toe pads. Timothy Judge notes that it's a member of the Eublepharinae, a sister clade to other geckos, so they're only distantly related to other subfamilies in Gekonidae. I guess we shouldn't be surprised at the insane depth and specialization of the knowledge of space-time viewers. But wow, we really can't get away with anything, can we? And just quickly, regarding the objections of vacuum diagrams to some of my statements in this whole quantum vacuum series. Dr. Diagrams. Vacuum. May I call you vacuum? Dr. Diagrams. I seed most of your points. You're clearly a professional in the field. Your username alone, like the Gekonator 5000, implies deep knowledge. So I haven't been ignoring your comments. It's just the middle of semester, so I've been putting it and everything else off. Let me quickly address your main point. You say that quantum field theory makes no prediction about the energy of the vacuum. Well, right, and I may have overemphasized the significance of Feynman and Wheeler's simplistic estimate. QFT may not make a prediction about the zero-point energy, but it does predict the existence of a fluctuating quantum vacuum. And current, beyond standard model theory, has a lot of trouble explaining why it produces the tiny energy density observed as dark energy, as opposed to either zero or very high energy density. That's the main point. But as you mentioned on the subreddit, I'm more of a gravity guy than a quantum guy, so thanks for keeping us straight. Tommy Atkins asks, what about Hawking radiation? Well spotted, Tommy. Hawking radiation is related to this whole vacuum energy virtual particle thing. In fact, why do you think we've been on it so long? This stuff is just a prelude to doing Hawking radiation and doing it properly. Stand by. A few of you point out that the EM drive now has a peer-reviewed paper coming from Harold White at NASA's EagleWorks Laboratories. The paper claims the measurement of a real thrust. We actually did a Spacetime Journal Club on that paper. Take a look. But the TLDR is that this paper did measure a change in force applied to a torsion pendulum in the correct direction when the resonant cavity was activated. The implied thrust was incredibly tiny, and there was a long list of systematic errors that may have been to blame which Harold White listed with admirable honesty. But given the fact that the EM drive defies the laws of physics, the true source of the thrust almost certainly lies within these systematics. And that brings me to the other point that a few of you raised. The idea that rejecting ideas like the EM drive or zero-point energy generators is an example of scientists being stuck in the dogma of the scientific establishment. Okay, so I won't deny that scientists, like anyone, can be resistant to change. We tend to cling to pet ideas, whether they are dogma or our own fringe fantasies. But it's a mistake to think that scientists adhere to dogma more than most people. In fact, scientists love overthrowing old ideas. It's what gets us grant money and fame and Nobel Prizes. Also, scientists do tend to be contrary, difficult individualists. And yet, they, well, we, are highly rational, and so we know that most fringe ideas must be false. Think of it this way. There's a certain way that the universe is, an actual objective reality that has a true nature that science is trying to find out. There's one way that the universe is, and infinite ways that it isn't. In our quest to find the true nature of reality, we must explore a lot of the ways that the universe isn't, in order to rule them out. 
those false paths sometimes sound pretty cool because they imply things like infinite free energy or fast space travel, but we can't be too distracted just because we want something to be true. Now, sometimes the path to truth is extremely surprising, like the invariance of the speed of light or the quantum nature of the subatomic world. That was some seriously fringe stuff right there. But the fact that fringe things are sometimes true doesn't mean that they're usually true. Most improbable paths forward are dead ends. Scientists will always explore them because that's how we find the true paths. And if a fringe idea does turn out to be right, then experiment will bear that out, even if it takes a fight. In short, sometimes when scientists poo-poo fringe ideas, it's because they're not ready for the truth. But more often, it's because these highly intelligent rational experts have seen plenty of similar fringe ideas and they know what poo-poo smells like. It has a distinct odor of, I really wish this were true. But the fact that fringe things are sometimes true doesn't mean they're usually true. Most improbable paths forward are dead ends. Scientists will always explore them because that's how we find the true paths. And if a fringe idea does turn out to be right, then experiment will bear that out, even if it takes a fight. In short, sometimes when scientists poo-poo fringe ideas, it's because they're not ready for the truth. But more often, it's because these highly intelligent rational experts have seen plenty of similar fringe ideas and they know what poo-poo smells like. It has a distinct odor of, I really wish this were true.